Let's review all of chapter two derivatives. The first thing is the derivative finds the slope of a curve at any point. So if I want the slope, for instance, at this point, it's called the tangent line, um, that is what it's asking for at a given point. Now normally, to find slope, you need two points. With calculus, you end up learning to find slope basically with one point using this limit process idea. And that is called the derivative, finding the slope at a given point on a graph. Now there are three things, three situations where you have no slope. Vertical lines have no slope, so the slope would be undefined. You do not have a slope at jagged points because basically there's two slopes. The, which one are you talking about, this slope or this slope? And here, there is no slope at a break or an asymptote because there's just it could be two different slopes at each side. And then again, a very important actually thing, a differentiability <laughs> implies it's continuous, meaning if it's differentiable, it's continuous. But the inverse of that doesn't mean work. I mean, if it's continuous, that doesn't mean it's differentiable. So, meaning this is continuous, but it's not differentiable. Anyways, um, okay. Define derivatives, which is the slope at a given point. You use this limit process, and uh, it, it's kind of long and lengthy, um, and we learn a shortcut very quickly. So, but there is this limit process that you can use to find derivatives. The shortcut is very simple. If you have a number, the slope is zero, and so forth. Um, polynomials are easy. You just take the power, bring it out front, make that a 6, draw the power by 1, and just do each piece one by one. For this, you want to first change things, like you first have the cubes, make this 8x cubed, and then you bring the uh, powers out on the bottom up as negative powers. And You have to deal with different kind of things for derivatives, it just get harder and harder, but there's some basic derivatives. Uh, you have to memorize what a cosine derivative is, it's actually a negative sign and stuff. So. Anyways, um, we're going to learn, once you find derivatives, we learn to find slopes at certain points. So I want the slope, say, at 5, 0. So all you do is you take the derivative, and then you plug in 5. So the slope is 0 at 5. Um, and uh, say you want to derive this, what you first have to do is FOIL it all out. Unless we do something later called chain rule. So you first basically got to make all things polynomials in order to derive them. Um, or it's best to. For instance, this could be a, something called a quotient rule, or you could just divide each piece by x before you derive it. Now, for instance, if you have radicals, you want to change them to fractional powers before you derive. Um, we also like a lot, have a lot of problems where we want to find tangent lines. So if I want a tangent line, equation of a tangent line, I need a slope and an x and a y. I have xy, but I want to need the slope at negative 1. So to find the slope at negative 1, well, you derive this, bam. Plug in negative 1, the x value, and the slope is 4. So the slope is 4 at this coordinate. Plug all that in, and you got your equation of a tangent line. If you want to find out a horizontal tangent line, well, horizontal means slope 0, flat, horizontal. So I basically want to find out when is my slope, derivative, 2x, equaling 0, and solve it. And then you get harder problems where they want you to find like a variable so that it is a tangent line. This kind of makes it more difficult. Um, okay, we're going to skip this. We're going to talk about here position, velocity, acceleration. Very important thing with derivatives. Um, you might not realize, but if you have a position function, which is titled, labeled s, when you derive that, you get velocity. So if this is feet, this is feet per second. And then if you derive velocity, you get acceleration, which is feet per second per second. You're, you're adding another per time. So Please understand that position leads to velocity when you derive it. When you derive this, you get acceleration. All right. Now, next. This one is you have a product rule and a quotient rule. When you have this, you could distribute the one-half power. Sorry, the x to one-half. You could distribute it, but there's also something called product rule. This is it. You also have something called quotient rule. Whenever you have a divide, you have a quotient rule. And uh, those are two major building block derivative. Um, rules. And then what's annoying about both these is you have to do a lot of simplification. And people hate derivatives because of simplification. So for instance here, what they did is they distributed the x to the fourth, and then what they did is they did this one, and then this was a quotient rule, and then kind of simplify. Here, this is a product rule, three sets, boom, boom, boom. Or I would have actually, honestly, it probably been easier to distribute and FOIL this first. And you got another product rule. 
So here, now we're using, this is a quotient rule, but again, we're trying to find the slope at this point. So it's just like the problem we talked about earlier, except your derivative's harder. Again, I want a horizontal tangent line, just like I talked about earlier. I derive it, set equal to zero, and solve. It's just, it's a harder derivative. It's a quotient rule to derive. So you get harder and harder derivatives as you go on, but you still do the same thing. You find tangent lines, you find horizontal tangent lines, and stuff like that. Anyways, we also do higher derivatives, meaning second derivatives. For instance, here, first I divide everything by x, and then I derive this, and then derive it again, called the second derivative. I have the fourth, I want to get to the sixth. So we derive it to the fifth, and then to the sixth derivative. So you can derive over and over again. The most we normally ever deal with is first and second derivatives. Okay, here is simply a velocity question going to acceleration question. So I derive it, and then I plug in five, plug in 10. I'm not going to talk about these graphs right now. So just again, remember that velocity leads to acceleration when you derive it. Okay, chain rule, very huge, big building block for derivatives. You basically um, have noticed there's something inside of another function. There's a G inside of an F, or a function inside of a function. So for this one, you see this is the inside piece. So what you do is you take the five, bring it out front, leave the inside, drop the five by one, and then derive the inside. And what happens here is you have a product with a quotient, which is kind of annoying. You have co sorry, a product, a product with a chain rule. This is a chain rule and a product here. So you sometimes have problems that mix product rules, quotient rules, and chain rules. And then you have this all this terrible simplification for people, and they hate it. But you have to learn to simplify um, very quickly and easily. It's all algebra. So, all right. And then just more chain rules. Here's a chain rule with inside a quotient. So when you drive the inside, it's a quotient rule. Here, I call it a double chain because you have like a double embedded piece. You, you have inside cosine, you have something inside of something. So there's these double chains which get harder and harder. Um, anyways, here again, we're just finding the tangent line at a point. And so if I want the tangent line at this point, you need the slope. I have my coordinate. So again, you just derive, you plug in pi over four, find the slope, make your tangent line. Again, these problems keep repeating themselves over and over just using harder derivatives. And then here we do our second derivative. So we do a, this right here is a double chain and you do a second derivative. All right. And then next we have implicits. Implicits mean you have an equation where it's not y equals. Your y's and x's are all mixed up. And what you do basically to do implicit differentiation is you drive everything just where it's at. So this right here is a product rule, boom, boom. This right here is another product rule, boom, boom. And this right here is zero. You derive negative two is zero. The, here, the difference is when you drive y, you have to realize there's a y prime or a dy dx because of the chain rule. When you drive x, it's x prime, which is one. But when you drive y's, you have a y prime. So every time you get a y prime, and then what happens is once you drive everything where it's at, you get the y primes to the left or one side, give everything else to the other side. You pull out a GCF y prime and then divide everything over and you got your answer. You just gotta be careful. Again, you have issues. Again, y, here's your y prime. Just drive everything where it's at, be careful. Get y prime to one side and then your answer, once you get y prime equals blah. Now, if you actually wanna find a derivative at a point, you actually need x and y. So for instance, I derive all this, boom. And then instead of simplifying all this, I think it's so cool that you just simply plug x and y in, boom, 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 boom. And then solve for y prime. Why make this all look like this and then plug in the numbers? Why not simply plug in the numbers right away and then find y prime? It saves you time. One thing though, with implicits, you need x and y to find your slope. You need both. Just make sure you're aware of that. And then here we do second derivative with implicits, which get really ugly, because what happens with second derivatives is you now, in your second derivative, you have to plug your first derivative back into it. So it gets really ugly. Um, there are a lot easier ways of doing it. I believe this example, I actually did it a little harder than I probably needed to. Um, but there are easier ways of doing it. And lastly, related rates are basically word problems. You're driving in respects to time. And when you drive in respects to time, this is dt, you then are given a whole bunch of information. And so, for instance, you're, you're, you're given a function, 
and then you're going to drive it in respect to the time, and then you give an information that you plug in and solve for what is left over. So if you see here, I plug these numbers in, and I solve for dy dt. Here I got this equation. I plugged in this information and found dx dt. dx dt is the change in x over time. dy dt is the change in y over time, and so forth. So you basically derive it in respect to time, look for your given information, plug it in, find out what's left or what they're asking for. I like related rates. There's some really cool problems, especially like how a, a sphere volume is changing over time or a cone um, height is changing over time, dhdt um, or dvdt. The key is you have to start off with a volume formula. You derive it in respect to time, and then you read your information, plug it all in, solve for what's left. Now this one here is a lot harder because what you have to do is you first have to get your, your function, but then you have to change your function so it's not R's and H's. You want to change it so it looks like we made it all in terms of H, and then we derive it, and then we plug in our information. So with related rates, the key then is you make these equations, usually they're geometric formulas a lot of times, and what you do is you derive them, but first make sure they're one variable. It usually makes a difference and helps. And then once you derive them, you plug in your data. So look for your data, look for your equations, drive, plug in information. And this last one, for instance, say this is the ladder. We're pushing the ladder against the wall, so the heights. This is going up as the base is moving this way. Our function is B, Pythagorean theorem. And when you drive all this, you plug in your information, you can find dBdt, the rate at which the base is changing as the height is changing at this rate. So just be careful. Uh, related rates are deriving your respects to time. People hate word problems, but they're, they're not as bad as you hopefully think.